Hey, First Corinthians chapter 12. Hey, I want to share a story with you. I think I may have shared this with some of you before. <laughs> um, when I was involved with YWAM, I used to go uh, to various different places, but one of the sort of places I frequented very regularly was the Solomon Islands. Anyone ever been to the Solomon Islands? Anyone here been to the Solomons? Yep. Yep, uh, Jackie's been there and she's got some stories to share, I know. Um, <coughs> anyway, I used to go in and out of the islands and used to take teams over there of young people and give them a missions experience and so on. And uh, one particular place that I found myself one time I was there was an, out, an island by the name of Savo Savo, S-A-V-O-S-A-V-O, Savo Savo. And uh, we jumped in this little kayak thing, it was about that wide, it sat about that high off the water, there was like 30 of us with backpacks and... A uh, guy took us across to this island. It's a volcanic island. So one day the locals took us for a walk up the, um, up the mountain. And as you got up, there was a stream coming down. The higher you got, the water got hotter and hotter to the point where it was boiling water coming out. We got up the top. We stood in the plug. The islanders dug a hole and put some bananas in there and cooked bananas in the sulfur, which now I'm saying it might not have been the greatest thing. But anyway, they did. And we ate these bananas that were cooked in sulfur. And they tasted like sulfur, which makes perfect sense. Um, Anyway, while we were there, one particular day I was down in the village talking with some of the, the people in this village we were staying, and then these kids started making a big ruckus and screaming and yelling in the bushes. And the kids came running out of the bushes and they all started speaking in their, their uh, mother tongue <coughs> and the adults went over to the bush and rummaged through the bush and came back and they'd found an exploded grenade shell from the Second World War. Now, any of you that know, know your um, history, the uh, Second World War, there were some battles fought over there, big battle, the Battle of Guadalcanal, with ships and land and stuff over in the islands. Well, the Japanese uh, set foot in, in certain parts of the island, and uh, so these villagers were saying, we're quite regularly coming across relics from the Second World War when the kids are playing in the bushes and that there, and this, this here is a, um, an exploded uh, grenade from the Second World War. Um, uh, can you just show everybody what that looks like up there? That's, a, that's a, an actual picture <coughs> of a grenade from the Second World War. So I was really excited about that, and I said to the locals, can I have that? And they said, of course you can. So I got some keros uh, petrol out of a little drum and I cleaned it up and I got all the dust and dirt because I knew Australian customs would be very picky as I came back. <coughs> cleaned it all up, packed it away, kept it very safe, came through customs, pulled it out, did the right thing, declared it at customs. They had a look at it. They could see it was clean and free from dust and dirt and everything like that. And I gave it back to me, came home. I kept that thing. I reckon I would have kept that for about... Oh, probably close to 10 years of my life. And it was a real uh, a talking point for me. I could, you know, tell people, hey, I've got this grenade and, and, and so on. And um, anyway, a couple of years ago, I decided, a handful of years ago, I decided, probably two, I think, what I'm going to do is, it's no good me just having this thing. I'm going to take it to a local uh, war museum or something, and I'm going to donate this Second World War exploded grenade shell to a war museum and give it to this war museum. So about a week before I was deciding to do that, I had some friends around. And um, we were having a chat, and I began to tell them about this um, exploded grenade that I was going to give to the war museum. And they said, oh, can we have a look at it? I said, yeah, of course you can. So I went and I got it, and I brought it, and I put it on the table. Now, these two men that I was sitting with are very intelligent men. They knew a few things, obviously knew a few things that I didn't. One of them looked at it, and then he looked back at me and said, are you really going to take this to the war museum? I said, yes, I am. And he said, Alan hate to break it to you, it's the float from a water tank. <laughs> and uh, if you look at the second picture here, that's a float from a water tank. So what I had was the round bit on the end, all dented up and stuff, all rusted and so on. The islanders told me that it was an exploded grenade. I just believed it was an exploded grenade. I brought it back. I'm so glad that I, I sat down with those two guys and I didn't walk into a war museum and go, hey, anybody, look at this exploded grenade. Would you like this? I just can't envision people running around in the Second World War throwing water tank floats, hey, incoming, you know, and ducking from a water tank float. It turns out what I thought I knew that thing was for, it actually wasn't for. It was for something completely different than what I actually thought that it was for. Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1, he says this. He says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Everyone say ignorant. I do not want you to be ignorant. In other words, I don't want you to take a water tank float to a war museum. That will be very, very embarrassing. That thing is not what you think it is, and it's not for the purpose that you think it was made for. It's made for a completely different purpose. 
Paul's actually writing here, and, and if you go back and you look at the entire picture of the Corinthian church, just to give you a bit of a rundown, if you want to see what happens when the culture of the world outside the church infiltrates what's going on inside the church, read the book of 1 Corinthians, because that's what it's about. Paul's writing to a bunch of believers who are in a society. Corinth was explained once by a Bible commentator as a, it's a it was basically a mix of New York uh, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and New York all piled into one. In other words, if it was happening, it was happening in Corinth. In fact, Corinth was such a corrupt society that there was a saying back in, in Jesus' time, and it was if someone was doing something really debaucherous and bad and ugly, they would say, oh, that's very Corinthian of you. So they even had this label about some of the stuff that went on in their society. Yet in the midst of all that, they actually had a church that was growing and that had this outbreak of what we'll call spiritual gifts. So I want to explain and expand a little bit. I don't want to get caught up on the gifts. What I want to say is this. In the midst of this society, this church that was infiltrated by the culture around them, there were these supernatural endowments and phenomena taking place by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even though these guys were messed up, even though theologically they had a lot of wrong lines of thinking. And this is why Paul's writing, he's saying, concerning spiritual gifts, you know all that stuff that's floating around in your lives that you're, you, that's, that's actually, yes, it is God, God's moving. But he says this, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Now that, that, that statement would have been a slap in the face to the Corinthians at the time. Because the Corinthians that he's writing to, they actually thought they weren't ignorant. What they were ignorant of was not information about this spiritual stuff that was going on, but it was the function and the purpose of those things that God was moving through them. And that's what they were ignorant of. And so Paul writes to them and he says this, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Their ignorance was not information about the gifts, but it was the proper use and proper purpose of the gifts. Anyone ever heard that phrase, ignorance is bliss? Anyone ever heard that, ignorance is bliss? Yeah? Um, according to ASIC, and I did some research this week, according to ASIC, there's about $1.5 billion in unclaimed money floating around in Australia. That's bank accounts, uh, life insurance policies, investment shares. $1.5 billion that belongs to somebody, but they're ignorant of the fact that that money actually belongs to them. The people that it belongs to are ignorant of the fact that it exists and that it's theirs. So ignorance is bliss unless some of that money is yours, right? If some of that money is yours, your ignorance is not bliss. In fact, your ignorance is costing you something. It's costing you something valuable. Uh, there was a headline on Wednesday on 7 News, um, uh, 7, the 7 News website, and then it said this. Lotto officials urging Australians to check their tickets with more than 22 million in unclaimed major lotto prizes. I'm just waiting to see if anyone reaches into their pocket. <laughs> no? Okay. We'll move on. 22 million in unclaimed lotto prizes as of this Wednesday just passed. And, and the lotto officials are saying this money sitting here and it actually belongs to somebody. You own this money. In fact, there's one particular uh, person, one person in the ACT and one person in Victoria who've actually won $4.8 million for themselves. And it's sitting there waiting to be claimed. Now, I'm just waiting to see if anybody from Victoria ACT reaches into their pockets now, no? Okay, good. We'll keep on moving. $4.8 million and it's yours and you're ignorant of the fact that it's there waiting for you to claim it. Ignorance is not always bliss. And then there are more serious times in life where ignorance is not bliss. Maybe with our bodies. Uh, anyone heard of people that there was a pain and ache, something going on in their body and they just waited too late to go to a doctor? to get checked out and maybe had they gone six months, 12 months earlier, maybe the outcome of that particular problem may have been different. What about marriages? How many of you have heard of people in, in a marriage and, and the marriage splits up, the relationship doesn't make it and, and, and one person will, will say, uh, I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming. I was, in other words, I was totally ignorant of what was going on. Maybe there was no communication in that relationship. I don't know why, but I know I've sat with a lot of people and, and you'll hear it with a, a relationship breakup, somebody going, I didn't see it coming. The other person did, but this person didn't. So ignorance, uh, ignorance costs us something and sometimes it costs us more than just the embarrassment that it costed me trying to say that this water float was used by the Japanese to kill people in World War II. That's embarrassing. But there are other things in life where our ignorance can actually cost us dearly. And this is what Paul's writing to the Corinthians about. 
He's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. In the Greek, the word gifts is not there in verse 1, by the way. It just says spirituals. I don't want you to be ignorant about spirituals, spiritual things. I don't want you to be ignorant about the spiritual side of your faith. I don't want you to be ignorant about the stuff that God does in and the stuff that God does through you. I don't want you to be ignorant of the tools that God's given you to accomplish the purpose that he's put you here to accomplish. I don't want you to be ignorant. And even though these guys thought they weren't, Paul says you are ignorant. Now the reason Paul knew they were ignorant is because this, when you're ignorant of those things, and we could probably all understand this, when you come up against people who are ignorant about spiritual gifts, spiritual things, it ends up being destructive. It ends up being destructive. And this is what Paul's saying to them. Right now, what you're doing with these endowments and these gifts that God is flowing through you, it's actually being destructive. I want, you, I want to correct your ignorance so that your use of these things goes from being destructive to being productive. Amen? Productive. Because God gave these endowments, the Spirit moves through us in these ways to bring productivity to be productive, they should never be something that's destructive. Yet so often in the life of, of Christians and churches, the gifts of the Spirit are something that is destructive. And that's exactly what's going on here in Corinth. These gifts were not being productive in terms of building the body. These gifts were being used in a way that was destructive. And so Paul starts by saying, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant of these things called spiritual gifts. And then he goes on and he writes 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, and 1 Corinthians 14. And all three of those chapters are dealing with the things that he says you are ignorant about. I don't want you to be ignorant. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to correct your ignorance in the next three chapters that I'm writing in this letter. Why? Because I want the use of these gifts and these things to be productive for you and the church. I don't want them to be destructive. Let me just share really quickly a bit of a vision I have with you. I envision a community of believers who live supernatural lives. Don't just go to a supernatural meeting. I believe when we gather together that God is here. Jesus said, we, two or more are gathered, I'm, I'm there. I believe that he's here with me as an individual, but when I gather with other people, I believe that he's there too. And there's something, Jesus said, there's something different about my presence with a group than there is just with you by yourself. I'm with you 100%, but when you get together with a group, there's just something about that. And I believe when we gather on a Sunday morning that there's, there's power here. Uh, there are some Sundays where uh, I'm blessed and maybe you're blessed enough to hear the stories of what, what the Holy Spirit spoke to somebody or, or, or a, a release or a freedom that took place in their life or something that shifted a perspective, maybe an answer to prayer or something that happened that, that day. Or sometimes I've had people come in and they'll just say, I don't know what it was, I just felt something this morning. And, and, and all you can do is say, hey, that's the presence of God that you felt when God's people gathered together. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it awesome? And, and I love those moments. Moments. But then there are some mornings where I come on in and, and you don't feel that. And sometimes you might come and go and feel like, well, I didn't feel anything. I didn't learn anything new. I didn't get any stars, bells, whistles. Um, nothing happened. And you can walk out. But, but, but I don't live my feelings. I, I live my faith. And I trust every time we gather together that stuff's happening. And a little bit like C.S. Lewis said, I quoted a couple of weeks ago, that isn't it funny how day-to-day -day, uh, day -day nothing changes, but when you get further back and look, down, look backwards, everything's different. And I believe that spiritually, that the, 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 the getting together, reading my Bible, it doesn't change my world. Sometimes I read it and bang, my life's changed. Sometimes I read it and put it away and go, well, that, what was the point of that? But I know what the point was because I'm, by faith I know that God is doing stuff when we get together. I know that God does stuff here, but I also know this, that God doesn't want me to be the kind of person who goes, I want to gather together and I'm so excited about getting in a supernatural service, um, um, something where, where God's presence is and he does supernatural things. No, no, God says I want a people that live supernatural lives. I want a people that believe that these things, these gifts, these operations, these endowments, the way that the Holy Spirit moves through us doesn't have to just happen when you sit down in a room with a group of people for an hour and a half on a Sunday. This stuff can happen at work. It can happen on a job site. This stuff can happen while you're sitting in a business meeting and you're back and forthing with somebody and you can't crack the code and you don't know how to get over this mountain and then God speaks to you and all of a sudden you have an answer to a problem or whatever. That's, that's what God wants. He wants us to live supernatural lives. It's interesting when you read Read the book of Acts, the first 30 years 
of the church's history, there's pretty much uh, uh, zero uh, supernatural activity that takes place in the walls of a church. It all took place out there. It all took place out there. And, and I think God wants us to get in our hearts a passion and a desire to be a supernatural people, not just come to supernatural meetings. Not just have a, 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 a supernatural, well, when, when I gather with someone to pray, I'm just going to get filled with faith and expectation that God's going to do something. But when I go and play touch football on Wednesday, or when I go and lay carpets, or when I go into the classroom, or when I go and do whatever, that kind of expectation is not there because this is different. That might be different, but God is not different. And God in you is not different. And I think that's what God wants us to have, is a vision of being a, a, a people, not just that go to supernatural meetings, but a people that live supernatural lives because that's the god that we link to 24 7 and by the way when i say that some people might be sitting here cringing it doesn't have to be weird okay it doesn't have to be weird peter and john are walking to the temple as they did quite often in the book of acts just after pentecost and it says they walk past the beggar and the beggar looked at them and was begging wanting money peter looks at them goes silver and gold we don't have what we do have in the name of jesus get up uh, and walk and here's what he did can we demonstrate it's my wife for everyone watching i can touch her okay so he reached out and put him to his feet and the guy got up now you look at that and go wow that's nothing but imagine if she hadn't walked Imagine if she'd been a beggar sitting there and you'd seen her every day and she got up. Now, here's the thing. Was there anything weird about Peter saying, silver and gold I don't have, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk, grabbing the hand and pulling him up? No bells, no whistles, no ruckus, no carry on. It was just natural. It was just natural. Jesus, in John chapter 4, is sitting out, 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 outside of, of Samaria there. He's sitting at a place where there's a well and his disciples have gone in the town to get food and a woman comes up and he starts engaging in natural, normal conversation. He says to her, go and get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, that's a good answer. You don't have a husband. You've actually had five and the guy you're shacked up with right now is not your husband. No fanfare, no bells, no whistles. It just came out of him very naturally because we're meant to be naturally supernatural. Amen? We're meant to be naturally supernatural. It doesn't have to be woo 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 Now, if God wants it to be woo 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 let it be woo 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 But it doesn't always work like that. I remember being in India. I only ever went to the movies once. The whole time I lived in India, I went to a cinema only once. Um, and, and, and I went with another man to watch the movie Titanic. It's the only country in the world where I would have gone with a man to watch Titanic. And so we walked in there and we're standing in line and there's all these Indians and <coughs> this guy's in front of me. I start a conversation with him. He's a, a military uh, guy in the Indian army. He's back in the, the city we're in. He's back in Nagpur um, just for a couple of weeks on leave and he decides to go to this movie and we're chatting and as we're talking, how you going, what's your name, I'm Alan, da 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 And then I looked at him and I said, hey, you're married, aren't you? And he said, well, yes, I am. I said, you've got two children, don't you? He said, yeah, I do. And I said, you actually got, they're little kids, you've got a little boy and you've got a little girl, don't you? Now, by this stage, I had his attention. Problem is, I didn't have my own attention. I went, see ya, walked in and sat down. And when I sat down, I thought back until he went into shop and thought, oh, God, you were doing something there, weren't you? God just flows quite naturally through us. It doesn't have to be strange and fantastic. God can speak to you through a conversation. You can be just having a conversation with somebody and, and, and a thought pops in your head and, 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 and it rolls out your mouth and it's an answer to prayer for that person. The point I'm making is this. I don't want people pulling back going, oh, no, we're talking about gifts now and it's going to get all crazy and weird. I'm not saying that. God is, is not the author of chaos, though sometimes God does have to create chaos in order to bring his kind of order into a situation. But I just want to assure you that I believe we are meant to be supernatural, but I believe we're meant to be naturally supernatural as well in fact most of my life is going to be supernatural did you know that most of my life is going to be supernatural i'm here in a human body for that crack in the wall we always point you to the crack in the wall and say that's that's your human existence eternity is there there that's the tiny little time bit of time we got to do something to make a difference for god is that crack in the wall but the reality is my life will go beyond that crack in the wall my life will go beyond that it just won't be here, confined to this physical body in this place. But I'm going to live longer than that. I have that faith in my heart that I'm going to go and be with Jesus. So this part of my life is actually the tiniest little piece of it. If eternity really is what I think eternity is, and it does go as long as I think it does, um, then you know this part of my life, this natural part of my life, is the, the most infinitesimal part of my existence. So I might as well get used to 
connecting with the Holy Spirit and operating supernaturally and, and, and realising that there's not just a natural side to life, but there is a spiritual side to life. Years ago, I went to work for Sunny Brand Chickens at Byron Bay. Anyone remember Sunny Brand Chickens at Byron? I used to work at Sunny Brand Chickens. And, and the day, I remember the day I got there. I rocked up and I brought to that Sunny Brand Chickens all my vast experience. I brought all of my dizzying intellect to the chicken industry. I brought all of my natural skills, my ability to use my opposable thumbs to hold a sharp object called a knife. I brought all that stuff and I rocked up that day. But you know what? It wasn't enough to get the job done, apparently. So they gave me this big overalls because I was working in a freezer all day. They gave me rubber boots. And they gave me a knife, the sharpest thing I've ever held in my life. Their knives are unbelievable. They gave me a knife. They gave me these tools that I didn't have in order to do the task they wanted me to do. And when we talk about the gifts, we talk about the power of God. How many of you know there's a task that we're called to do that our natural selves is not going to be enough to achieve? My natural self will take me to a certain point. My natural intelligence will get me to a certain point. But there's a point where my intelligence runs out and I can't go any further because I don't know enough. There's a point where my natural skills and abilities will get me. Uh, they, they, my personality will open certain doors, I guess, and give me certain platforms in and, and people's world and so on. But there's a point where everything natural about me ends. But God wants me to go beyond that. But there are things I need to take me beyond that. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about these supernatural endowments and these things that God wants to do uh, uh, in our world and, and flow through us is because we're called, we're called to do something greater than just have some natural, infinitesimal, finite impact here in the natural world. We're, 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 we're dwelled, we're filled by a supernatural spirit, the spirit of God. And that spirit wants to flow through us and, and do things through us that are beyond just this natural world. Who, who, who could do with a bit of wisdom beyond their own wisdom? Yeah? Well, well, this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Who could do with, with, with some insight to something right now that's beyond your natural insight? You've looked at it and gone, I can't go any further than here. It doesn't make you a bad person, it just makes you human. But God says, I've got tools, things that I want to go through you to take you to that next place, to get beyond there. And then when we get to the other side, we turn around and we go, God, aren't you amazing? Because there's no way I, I, I can't do that. God, I can't, I can't heal Daniel's knee. Um, doctors would have had a way better chance of bringing healing to that knee because they understand all that, how that all works. You know? But for whatever reason, Daniel didn't go to a doctor or for whatever reason that happened that we're there and we prayed. And you know what? So God does something in Daniel's knee. I can't do that. Daniel can't do that, but God did something in that situation and he needs to get all the praise and the glory for it. The point is that there is stuff that, that God's going to allow you to do, calls you to do, wants you to do, but you don't have enough in yourself. You need to connect with him. You need to allow him to flow through you. So it doesn't have to be weird. Okay, so what are some of the things that Paul wanted them to know in order for them to go from destructive to productive? What were some of the things that he wanted them to know? Number one, we are empowered, not overpowered by God. We're empowered, not overpowered by God. The, the, the pagan religions, and they're all over the place, and Corinth had every religion going, and one of the things that happened in those pagan religions was that they believed that they would get to a point where the, the God would overpower them. And then that God would take possession of them and flow through them, which then meant whatever you did was, of course, the will of God because God was in control. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've met Christians who kind of feel like that. They'll do something and it's an absolute disastrous thing and then they'll go, well, it was God. God made me do it. Let me just put it, be up front. One of the things that Paul's correcting with these guys, he's saying God didn't make you do it because God doesn't make you do anything. God empowers us, but he never, ever over powers us. Verse 2, 1 Corinthians 12, he says, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Uh, the NIV says you were influenced and led astray. That word where he says you're carried away, uh, that phrase, that word is used in the Greek to refer to somebody that was a prisoner, that was bound in fetters and, and, and the guard had a chain and was leading them away. In other words, they didn't have a choice. Paul's saying, you guys have got to stop saying, I didn't have a choice. You do have a choice. It's chaos and madness when you guys get together. And everybody's just blaming God, saying, well, God's making me. He's saying, no, 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 that's not true because God doesn't overpower you. God empowers you. So when the Holy Spirit moves through you, it's, a, it's, it's an invitation. The Holy Spirit gives us invitations, not court summonses. You know, court summons. You do it or else. 
It's, it's not like that. It's an invitation that God makes to us. So the Holy Spirit empowers. He doesn't overpower. This is what Paul wants to say to them. In 1 Corinthians 14, 28, again, keep in mind 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, they're all addressing the same issue. Okay? They're all addressing the same issue. And it's the misuse and the misappropriation of what Paul terms spirituals or we today know as spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 14, 28. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent. He's talking about people that were getting up and just blabbering off in tongues, just giving messages in tongues that nobody could understand. He said, I'd rather you got up front and you gave some intelligent words that people understood. No point getting up going, blah, 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 and sitting down, everyone's scratching their head going, what? He said, it's not how it works. That's not God. He says, I'd rather that you got up and gave intelligent words. But if you are going to do that, he says, there were some people there that were gifted with the ability to interpret it. But he says to the person sitting there, you've got this thing and you feel like you've got to get up and give a message in tongues. But if you haven't, got, if you haven't found an interpreter and somebody definitely has an interpreter, don't get up. In other words, you're in control. Don't blame God. You can stop. You can hold yourself back. Don't do it. Don't do it. 1 Corinthians 14, 32, a couple of verses later, he says this, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, God didn't make you do anything. He doesn't make you do anything. He, he gives you invitations, he invites you to flow with him. He invites you to pass that word on to that person. You don't have to do it. He's not going to hate you if you don't take the opportunity. Sometimes we're scared, sometimes we're nervous, sometimes we're insecure. Sometimes we've got all these reasons why we don't step out in faith and the little promptings of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't get mad at us. He doesn't turn his back on us. But the Holy Spirit extends invitations to us. He never, ever overpowers us. He never overpowers us. I know people that are afraid to open themselves up to the gifts of the Spirit. They're afraid to open themselves up to the Holy Spirit because they genuinely believe if I open my spirit up, then the devil's going to come on in there and he's going to mess me up and take me off. To Listen, have more faith in your heavenly Father's ability to keep you safe than in the devil's ability to rip you off. Hey? Our Father loves us. And he also wants us to be open to the gifts of the Spirit. He wants us to be open for his supernatural endowments to flow through us. And Paul's saying this, that we're empowered by God. We're not overpowered by God. Second thing, he says the gifts vary in effect, but they don't vary in value. Gifts vary in effect, they don't vary in value. You know, you know in, in, in later on in 1 Corinthians 12, we, talks, we, get, we get one of our greatest analogies of the church from Paul's writings in, Cor in, in Corinthians where he talks about the body and many parts. You know, we read that sometimes we isolate these things and we don't understand the context. The context there is that they were sitting there going, certain gifts are better than others. Because you flowed in this once, you're better than that person over there who didn't in that moment. And there was this... this one-upmanship going on and they looked at these gifts as in because you've got that you're more spiritual in Corinth the big issue what it appears to be from what Paul writes is that tongues was the biggest issue if you had that man you've made it you've made it and Paul goes well no God, God, God puts the body together and the spirit does what the spirit wants to do uh, the, 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 the gifts may vary in the impact and what, that, what happens the gifts vary in impact they do not vary in value they do not vary in value. You see, the, the value of the gifts don't come from what the gift is. The value of the gift comes from who gave it to you. Who gave it to you? If God gave you a five-cent piece and he gave you a $100 bill, they both have equal value because they came from God. God's where the value comes from, not the thing. Not the thing, but in Corinth, they were getting value out of which gift they had. That's why he goes on, he says, he starts talking about these ones where you say, I don't have any, this part of the body doesn't care about that, doesn't need that part. Yes, you do. They're all the gifts are needed, all that stuff's needed because uh, God distributes those things because they're all needed to build up the body and they're all needed to achieve the mission of the church. Every part of it, every gift, every talent that we have. The gifts vary in effect, but they don't vary in value. Number three, real quick, the gifts flow through you, but they're not for you. The gifts flow through you, but they're not for you. Again, the Corinthians were getting value thinking that this, if, if, I, if I have this gift, if this gift was given to me, then it's my gift. And then it became enough to just say, hey, I've got this gift. Hey, everybody. When we lived in India, one of the funniest things that I used to find in India was guys would come up to me all the time and they would say, oh, hello, brother, my name's such and such uh, and, and here's my card. And they'd give me their business card and it would say, you know, I don't know, Sanjay Pradeep or whatever, profit to the nations. 
And it's like I'm looking at a card going, you've got a business card giving me a business card to tell me that you're a prophet to the nation. So I'd ask him, so, so tell me, where, what nations have you been to? Oh, none. Okay. Um, is there a church you're a part of, a body where you... Oh, no, none. Okay, so what prophecies have come... Have you, oh, nothing at the moment. It's like, really? You're a prophet to the nations? But it didn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I'm doing anything with it. What matters is I've got this. What matters is I've got this gift. Well, you know what? The gift is not for you. It's meant to go through you. The gift wasn't given to you for you. It was given to you for the benefit of other people. Whatever gift you've got, it's there for the benefit of somebody else, not you. I, 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 love, um, I love the calling of Moses. Anyone ever, you go back and you read Moses, when God called Moses, and, and, and uh, that burning bush encounter there, and God, and, and God says this to Moses. <laughs> he says, Moses, I've heard the cry of my people Israel, and so I'm going to send you. In other words, Moses, I didn't come to you for you. I didn't come to you because you're so great and you're so wonderful. I came to you because I want to use you to be an answer to somebody else's prayer. My focus is Israel. Israel is struggling. I've got to, I've got to, fix, I've got to help them. I've got to lead them out. I've got to answer this prayer and I'm going to use you to flow through you to answer their prayer. And so it is with the gifts. He's trying to say to the Corinthians that, that, that the gifts are meant to flow through you because those gifts are for somebody Else. It's not enough to go, oh, look, I heard the Lord spoke to me. Yeah, what sort of, how would it be if God spoke to me? Jackie gave me this word for you. And it's just, I think it's really got the potential to change your life. It's awesome. God told it to me. And then I walked away. She's like, well, hang on, what's the gift? It doesn't matter. God gave it to me. That's, that's all that matters. Of course it doesn't matter. It's there for somebody else to be passed on to somebody else. It's not there for myself. They're meant to flow through you, but they're not for you. Many years ago, I went shopping with a mate of mine, lovely, wonderful Christian guy. We went up the Gold Coast. We used to go up there at Christmas time, and I would shop for my wife, and he would shop for his. And uh, I remember uh, last time I went up there with him, we went shopping. And uh, I went and I bought, you know, I nailed it probably, because I always do, uh, perfume and clothes and, and, and whatever it is that was on Jackie's mind. I sought the Spirit of God, and I knew what it was, and I, I got it. I'm sure it happened like that. It was a while ago. Um, and, and, and so Joe, anyway, Joe goes shopping for his wife, and I said, let's meet at a certain time, and we'll have some dinner, and then we'll jump in the car and go home. So we meet, and I'm showing all these nice things I got for my wife, and then I said, Joe, what did you get for Fiona? And so Joe opens up his bag, and he pulls out a you know, pair of shoes, and, so, and then he pulls out the Mad Max DVD box set. The Mad Max, the, I looked at the, and I said, does she like Mad Max? He said, I don't know. I said, Joe, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I think you bought that gift for you. And he just smiled. Of course I did. So, but he did Christmas Day. He wrapped it up, put it under the tree with her name on it. And she opens it, and he took the thing. It's not like that. God doesn't, the gifts are not for me. The gifts are for somebody else, to flow through me to be a blessing to somebody else. Uh, number four, moving quickly, motivation matters. And the one that matters most is love. Motivation matters, and the one that matters the most is love. If we want to be used by God in his supernatural endowments, his gifts, if we want God to use us in them, the motivation has to be love. Not showmanship, not here I am, not look what I've got. The motivation has to be a motivation of love. You know what's interesting um, is if you go back and you uh, read all the major uh, uh, passages in the New Testament where people wrote about gifts, not just the gifts of the Spirit, but where they wrote in, in Ephesians about um, apostles, prophets, teachers, they write in uh, Romans. All the major uh, passages about gifts, Romans 12, verse 3 and 8, Speaking about gifts is followed by verse 9 that says, Let love be without hypocrisy. It's followed by a verse on love. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is followed by what? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So how many of you had 1 Corinthians 13 read out at your wedding? Anybody here use those? Yep. Well, you know what? You have, a dis you have a dysfunctional church that didn't know how to use spiritual gifts to thank for that. Isn't that awesome? No? If it wasn't for these guys who didn't know how to flow in spiritual gifts, you wouldn't have this passage on love because he's speaking about spiritual gifts and the right, appropriate use of them. That's the context for this great love passage that everybody reads out at their weddings. He's saying the motivation is love. If you don't have love, I don't care what prophetic word you've got. If you walk up and give that gift that I'm flowing through you to somebody, if you give that to them and it's not done in a motivation of love, you are just making a bunch of noise and making no difference. In other words, you are going to be destructive, not productive. And the motivation has to be love. It has to be love. It's the only motivation that's appropriate. 
Ephesians chapter 4, we all know God gave some apostles, prophets, teachers, and so on. It's followed by Ephesians chapter 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. Whenever the writers talked about gifts, they always backed it up with a conversation about love because love is the motivation. Love is the motivation that we need. Number five, number five, the gifts are received by faith. They're not earned through works. They're received by faith. They're not earned through works. I, I, I often have uh, been with YWAM for years and, and, and uh, being around uh, you know, people coming from all kinds of different backgrounds. It's, it's amazing how many people kind of feel like that we've got to get to a certain point of spirituality or a certain place of holiness before God will flow through us in these fashions. That's why it's so important that fruit matters. That's why Jesus said you'll know people by their fruits, not by their gifts. Don't get caught up in the giftings of people. Look at the fruit of their life. Look at the fruit. Hey, didn't we, didn't we heal the sick in your name and raise the dead and cast out demons and do all this stuff? And Jesus didn't say, no, you didn't. He said, yeah, 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 but apart from me, I didn't know you. We didn't have a relationship. There's nothing going on intimacy-wise with you and with me. Do you think I did all that stuff for you? I did that because of the people. I flowed through you because of the people. Don't ever think because God flows through you that that's a mark of, of some kind of maturity or spirituality. God will use a donkey, and he still does. Amen? God can speak through anybody or move through anybody. The Greek word that's mostly translated gifts in the New Testament is the word charisma, and it literally means a thing of grace, a favour with which one receives without any merit of his own. You can't earn them. That's exciting. That means that anybody in this room right now could open themselves up and say, Lord, can you begin to use me in the gifts? You don't have to get to a certain point. We can open ourselves up right now where we are and say, Lord, would you, would you use me? And I believe that God would give a major resounding yes, yes, because I want people with the right heart and I want my church to capture again the supernatural flavour of who we are as a people. We are not just a Lions Club getting together for an hour and a half on a Sunday and occasionally having a barbecue. We have power upon us. We have stuff that we have access to that those that don't know Jesus don't have access to. Well, they do, but it's coming from a different spirit. But we have access to the Father. We have access to the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, verse 2 to 5 says this. It says, This only I want to learn from you. Paul writing to the Galatians. He says, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And the obvious answer to the question is hearing of faith. You shared the gospel with us. We bowed our knee to that. We accepted what Jesus did and the promise of the Father came into our worlds. So the answer is we're hearing of faith. And he goes on in verse 5. He says, Therefore... He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Same answer. He does it by the hearing of faith. He does it because we trust, because we believe, because we expect, because we're prepared to step out. You know, D Dan Murphy's, I, I used to do, well, when I was a manager at Dan's, and, and we would uh, have you know, staff, that, anyone have staff that call up sick when the sun's out and the waves are pumping? Yeah, and when it's not, though, they're never sick. They're never sick on a bad day, always sick on a good day. Um, well, we used to have to deal with that all the time. I'd go in 6 o'clock in the morning, get things ready, and then the phone would start ringing. Oh, I can't make it in today. <coughs> and then somebody would tell me later on, oh, here's a Facebook photo. They're at the beach having hamburgers, you know. It's like, whatever. But here's the thing. I'd get on the phone, and I'd start ringing up all the other casual and part-time staff. Hey, you've got a shift here. Can you come on in? No, I can't. Okay, no worries. Ring the next one. Would you come in? No, I can't. And then finally, maybe fourth or fifth phone call, I'd get someone and say, yep, I'm in now. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Awesome. So you know what happened next time somebody cancelled their, their, their shift? I'd pick up the phone and that person I rang fifth, they're the person I rang first. Hey, would you come? Yep, no worries. Why? Well, because I generally went to the people that I had learnt to say yes. I generally, it, it, I, I, I didn't, it's not that I didn't care about the other people. But by saying yes, you make yourself available for the next phone call. And that's why I think it's important that we understand that these gifts are received by faith. That means right now we could start responding to the promptings and the leadings of the Spirit. You could be sitting here right now and, and there are people in this room right now with needs and God could lay a, a word or a thought or something on your heart to go and share with that person or, 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 or go and pray with somebody or something like that. It's, it's, it's the body ministering to the body. God could do that and he could do it right now. 
But here's what I've found in my life. My prayer to God is this. God, I want to be the guy that says yes as soon as you ring me. Because I know if I'm the person that says yes, then God, next time you have a job to be done, whether I'm here in a, in a spiritual meeting, whether I'm at the football grounds, whether I'm in Woolworths buying my groceries, if you've got something you want to do, I want, that, I want to be that guy that you know you can ring straight away and say, I've got, yep, I'll do it. Yep, I'll do it. That's why it's, it's so important to open ourselves up and, and step out in faith. Step out in faith and trust God and believe that he wants to use us in these supernatural ways. And finally, last one. The gifts are to be shown, not simply known. Paul actually says that the, these things are manifestations. He uses the word manifestations of the Spirit. That, that word manifestation, it, it means to, to show something, to bring uh, an event or action, an object that shows or embodies something abstract or theoretical. The actions or fact of showing something. And, and these gifts are not just something that we read about and we should go to Bible college and study about. You know what's interesting? Paul doesn't give any definitions to any of them. Anyone ever notice that? We all think we know what the definitions are because we've all read a book by this person or that person or that person. But as somebody that reads very broadly, I'll guarantee you this, that commentators will tell you we have no definitions of any of these gifts that Paul goes on to mention in 1 Corinthians 12. But what we do know is this. The Corinthians already knew what he was talking about. He didn't need to expand and explain. A word of wisdom is this. A word of knowledge is this. He didn't do that because his hearers knew what he was talking about. And because of that, he didn't go on and give us great big descriptions. This commentator will say, a word of wisdom is that. These commentators will say it's that. The truth is we need to be humble enough to admit that there's no biblical text that gives us any definition to them. But what we do know is that they're supernatural and God moves through us in different ways. Don't get caught up on definitions. There's no exhaustive uh, definition. And the other thing is I don't believe either that Paul gave us an exhaustive list of what the gifts were. That's not the point. Why did Paul pick these, these nine gifts that he chooses to talk about? Because they were the most disruptive of the group. He's, remember, he's writing to correct some ignorance. So he's not going all... Here's an exhaustive list of every gift that God... Think about it. How inf infinite is God's power, ability and mind? Really, we think there's only nine gifts? Nine ways that he'll supernaturally move through you? To Come on. Come on. Paul wasn't writing to go, here, let's lock it in. It's only nine gifts and here's the definitions. No, no. What he's trying to say is, yes, God moves supernaturally through us. So let's believe, let's expect, and let's step out in faith. These guys were off the ball. They had theological problems, all kinds of things going on. But even in the midst of it, listen to what Paul says to them in closing in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. NIV says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. In spite of the current problems in Corinth, Paul still encourages them, you guys need to go after these gifts. Go after them. They're a good thing. Don't let a bad experience ruin it for you. Don't let a lack of understanding ruin it for you. Go after these things. Let them become a part of your world. Operate in them naturally. Be motivated by love. Let them flow through you because our God is still a supernatural God. He didn't stop being supernatural when the Bible was written. He didn't stop being supernatural after Jesus was resurrected. Our God is supernatural and he flows through us. That word desire in the Greek, it literally means this. It means to burn with zeal for. Burn with zeal for. Desire earnestly. Strive after to be zealously sought after. In other words, Paul's saying you should desire earnestly with a fire in your heart to go after these things because they're God's gift to us to move through us to do amazing things here on planet Earth.